We are Osra Academy, bringing you virtual learning direct to your desktop or mobile device, wherever you are and whenever you need it. We believe in the value of appropriate and relevant clinical education and have a wide range of learning formats specifically for you. Whether this is for your own CPD, product insight and awareness, or detailed training relevant to your own clinical needs, we provide a huge range of remote learning opportunities specifically tailored to you. We bring together key opinion leaders sharing insights into orthopaedic and prosthetic clinical pathways. Our own clinical and professional sales teams offering you detailed product insight and evidence-based education. Large-scale, secure webinars, professionally managed with multimedia content. Virtual fittings and user demonstrations offering remote, interactive support to colleagues and customers in their own workplace. Pre-requested one-to-one virtual meetings with our clinical teams providing real-time diagnostics and support. Open meetings allowing for multi-site interaction and knowledge sharing. Contact us now to arrange your own virtual training and education meeting and visit our website to browse our back catalogue of webinars and other online education events. We are Osser Academy, providing your educational needs. and welcome to this evening's webinar, our 17th in our current KOL webinar series. I hope you're all well this evening. Uh, although I may look like I'm in a similar position uh, as I normally am, I'm actually at the Pure Sports St Paul's Clinic in London this evening uh, as we've taken the, the webinar out on the road. Uh, so we've been very fortunate this evening to be joined by Mr Paul Tricker uh, and also Andrew Goodall uh, for this evening's practical webinar session. Uh, but before we start all that, I'm just going to pass over to my colleague Adj, who's on a dynamic camera, I'm just going to have a quick, uh, short introduction from Simon Devan, um, who is the CEO here at Pure Sports Medicine uh, in London. So I'm just doing a good uh, job on the, uh, the dynamic camera, and I'll pass over to Simon before we get things started. Good evening, everyone. I'm Simon Devan, the Chief Executive at Pure Sports Medicine. Welcome to our St Paul's Clinic here in the centre of London. We're delighted to be hosting the team from OSSA this evening for this addition to their webinar series. I hope you're all managing to stay safe and well and you enjoy tonight's event. Thank you. So thank you to Simon for, for letting us use the facility here. Uh, as I said before, uh, very fortunate to be joined by Mr. Paul Tricker, consultant knee surgeon at St. Peter's and also the Schoen Clinic here in London. Uh, and also Andrew Goodall, um, who's the clinical manager and physiotherapist here at Pure Sports in London. So thank you this evening for joining us. Um, it's a bit different this evening, so it could be interesting viewing. It's been uh, a bit uh, more difficult, shall we say, than having it set up in the, in the Manchester office. Um, but it's going to be very much not a PowerPoint presentation this evening. Uh, we're going to have four patients, a uh, 20-minute uh, whistle-stop tour of those four patients. And Paul and Andrew are going to assess those patients and see it from a consultant, but also a physiotherapist's point of view. Uh, so I hope you uh, enjoy it this evening. Uh, a bit more interactive than normal. Uh, we've got several camera angles, as we normally do. Um, but Paul and Andrew are going to take us through that this evening. So, uh, so thank you both for joining us. Um, just to get things started, as we always do, if you've not joined us uh, before for one of our webinars, uh, we try to make these uh, in, uh, sessions as interactive as possible. So if you've uh, used Zoom in the past, and I'm sure you have in the last six months, uh, you can ask any questions in the Q&A function. My colleague Giles will be manning that this evening. Uh, and if there's any pertinent questions, Giles will interrupt both Paul and Andrew to ask that question and get their insight. As always, the webinars are recorded, um, so they will be posted onto the Osser Academy YouTube channel uh, or the Osser UK website uh, for viewed usually between 48 and 72 hours after this evening. Uh, there's also an e-certificate which will be sent tomorrow uh, for your attendance this evening, um, but there's also a follow-up questionnaire sent out with that as well. So please do, if you have any topics you'd like to discuss uh, or you think how we can improve this webinar format, please put them in. Uh, and we'll take that uh, into account moving forward. So a little bit different this evening, coming out of our comfort zone and hopefully raising the bar a little bit more. Uh, I hope you enjoy the evening. Uh, I'll pass over to, to Paul uh, and to Andrew. Uh, thank you both again for, for joining us this evening uh, and uh, enjoy. Hey, thank you for having us this evening. Um, we're here uh, with Paul. Hi, Andy. Uh, we're at, uh, as I said, we're at uh, Pure Sports Medicine at St Paul's. Um, we've got four patients with us today. Um, we felt it would be nice to bring a, a different vibe to one of these webinars. Um, and as such, we're going to sort of have a, uh, a little bit of interplay about what we see, what's going on with these patients. And we're going to try to have a look at some 
uh, through the spectrum of ATL, and then we're going to move on to, the, to an OA that's being managed um, non-operatively. Feel free, guys, to ask any questions during the webinar. I'd say we've got four patients from non-operative um, ACL injury through to OA. And if there's any tips or tricks or demonstrations you want us to, to demonstrate or show, then please ask using the Q&A function. Absolutely. So uh, what we'll do is we'll bring in our first patient, uh, Laddie. Um, just to bring him in, as, as if you come over, Laddie, um, we'll get you to grab a seat. Um, with Lad Laddie's one of my patients. Um, I'm seeing him and have been seeing him for a number of months now. Um, we started off... Um, actually during lockdown, so we were doing a lot of uh, virtual sessions as well. So um, he's done extremely well considering it's uh, virtual. Um, I've asked him to come and join us today because uh, he hasn't had his ACL reconstruction at this point. Um, uh, he is uh, scheduled for one, uh, but we want to talk about how this knee is presenting, um, whether he could potentially be a COPA, and whether it would be necessary for him to, to, or to consider um, having an ACL or whether he could consider going down the, the non-operative um, strategy. So what, what I'd like to do at this point is bring Paul in. Um, I'll ask Paul to examine the knee. Uh, and then once Paul's examined the knee, we'll talk a little bit about, um, about Laddie's knee, what Paul sees from a surgical point perspective. And then we'll talk a little bit about the kind of the, the COPA, non-COPA strategy, and we'll, we'll, we'll dive into what we've done with Laddie. Um, so Paul, if I get you to come in, I'll, I'll, I'll come out of the way. Hi, Laddie. How are you? Hi. Good, thank you. So Laddie, how old are you? I'm 29. And what's your job? I uh, work in banking. In banking. Yeah. And do you do any sports? Yeah, so I play football uh, at an amateur level. At which level? Uh, amateur, county, county level. Do you, which, which football team do you support? Uh, Manchester United. Do you know which team I support? No. Tottenham? <laughs> ah, okay, we won't, we, won't, we won't discuss any further. And um, <coughs> how did you injure your knee? Uh, so playing... I took the weight of um, my goalkeeper and the opponent striker uh, while my foot was planted on the uh, astroturf. Okay, and what happened? Uh, I, I felt a bit of a, a snap in my knee. Um, thought it was a sort of thought it was a little bit of pain until a few days later when I had an MRI on it. Did you play on at the time? No, I went straight off. Uh, did your knee swell up? Over sort of. Two days it did, yes. But by the time you got off the pitch, it wasn't swollen? No. So you couldn't play out? But I, no, I couldn't play out. So non-contact pivoting injury on the pitch? Yes. And you couldn't play on? Yeah, that's correct. And so that's really important everyone to remember that defined. Okay, so then you haven't had surgery? No, I haven't had surgery. Um, Andrew and I have talked about it. Uh, and I think I've decided to have surgery which we're having next month um just because i feel like it it, it I, I feel like at the moment it's not uh quite strong enough okay. and you've been doing lots of exercises yeah and you want to get back to football yes is that one of the main reasons to get to get your surgery done yeah and so why haven't you had surgery now because of lockdown or yeah so i uh in my injury was a week before lockdown um and then um yeah, the, the, there was a delay because of for wait to wait for the hospitals to reopen. Okay. Do you mind if I examine your knee? Yep. Is it painful no, at all? It's fine. Yep. It's not painful at all. Uh no, no. Okay. So and it's this leg. It's the right knee. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So I'm just going to have a look at this one. So I'm just testing for hyperextension now. Looking at quad size. So Adja, can you see the quads on the top? Tense your quads for me. Just tense. Oh, yes. Yeah. So pretty good, both sides, really good quads on both sides. Lift your leg up straight for me and bend as much as you can. Good. And just the other one to compare and bend. Really good. And you got no pain in the knee? No, no pain. And let me just do it. So I just want to do a little abbreviating about Murray's test. And on your scan, was it just an ACL? Yeah, it was a full rupture of the ACL. Okay. No other damage. No other cartilage injury or anything? No. Okay. And does your knee give way? Uh, not recently, no. Mm. Initially it did. How many times has it given way since the injury? Uh, several, several times in the first kind of few months. Just, re months. just relax your head back for me. So I hope you can all see that from the side view. That Actually, got yeah. A nice positive lapman. I just, you can do it from the side as well. Okay, so I'm just going to try a little pivot shift. 
completely relax if you can. So what are you looking for here, Paul? What, so why I'm are we doing this pivot? The pivot shows me a degree of instability on the knee and we sublux the tibia forward. And as you push the knee into valgus internal rotation, you get a little clunk back, which you can see that he's not got a positive at Murray's test. His knee's quite quiet. He's got really good quads. Um, and he's got an isolated ACL injury. So you're due to have surgery by one of my colleagues, uh, Peter Hill, your surgeon, really good surgeon. Um, and and that was the main reason for that was what was the swaying that you want to play football again? It was, yeah, mainly around wanting to play back, wanting to get back to football. Okay, and you've obviously spoke to your physiotherapist. Yeah. And have you done any? Did you wear a brace or did you get back to any jogging or anything since the injury? So we've been doing a few exercises, no jogging yet, but sort of jumping, um, stretches, uh, kind of. Uh, weight, weighted exercises as well, the leg press, squats, uh, lunges, a lot of lunges as well. Okay. Do you do any any other sport besides football? Um, do you ski mainly weightlifting. That's about that's about it, really. Okay. Uh, so cycling a little bit as well. So no other pivoting sports other than football. No. Okay. Okay, Paul. So what what I'm interested in there is um, what you what you felt. So we saw we saw a positive pivot shift, and yeah. we saw obviously a positive Lackman. With his history, um, how how would you feel about Laddie if he chose, or how would you feel about him deciding to have a, a non-operative um, approach if he, if if he, he so had decided that off of your clinical exam? Yes, yeah, so he's 29. Uh, he's middle aged He's sorry. But he's, um, he's not extremely young. He's not at high risk of re-rupture. He's got no other meniscal pathology. And he's not clinically, his memories is negative. And we squatted him already. And I think he, he's not getting any pain on squats. Uh, so no other, no other injuries, no associated injuries. Um, really good quads. He's got a very quiet knee. Very little instability since the injury. So these are all good positive prognostic factors for yeah. treating him non-operatively. The key for me is his return and desire to get back to football. Um, despite being a Man United fan, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, if he wants to play football at 29, he should be allowed to play football. Agreed, yeah, yeah. And you've obviously discussed this. How did that discussion go with you? With this, with yeah, that? so uh, with, for me, it was all about um, how he felt about potentially going non-op or operative. So uh, we know that the kind of conclusion about whether you can assess for a COPA or, or non-COPA is still sort of, the jury's out a little bit in terms of all of the exact tests that mean this person is or isn't a COPA. Mm. Um, but we discussed how he felt about going non-operatively purely on the basis as we've spoke on our Instagram lives about the fact that, you know, he is an isolated ACL. He's got no other municipal pathology. And other than the, the given way that he experienced kind of almost immediately after the injury. Yeah. There is, you know, he, he qualifies relatively well yeah. on that. Um, but I, I always think in terms of the wins here, mm. if, if the patient is, if their beliefs are towards the stability being gained with the surgery, I think sometimes pushing an, op an operative approach is, is, is a difficult one. And mm. uh, we've seen that in the, you know, in the studies where people can go non-op for a while and then they convert. And I think a lot of that comes down to that psychology, psychological sort of um, belief that that's the way they're going to gain the stability because mm. that is performing very well. You really you can see. What other factors are you looking for? Because for me, we've discussed what I'm looking for as to someone going ACL surgery or not surgery. Uh, what, what else are you looking for? Are there any objective measurements or scores you can use? Yeah, so um, I, I, I use a bit of a battery and I think that's the, the, the general gist of the kind of uh, evidence out there is that you have to use a number of things. So uh, I would use um, uh, quad and hamstring uh, limb symmetry index or, or a quad score, a strength score. That might be done you know, if you've got isopathetic available then amazing. Mm. Um, we use a handheld dynamometer. Mm. Um, I'll always test them as soon as I see them on the, on the non-injured side to try and get as close a kind of uh, numerical objective score for their strength before things deteriorate. But obviously we know that that's... Um, that changes over time. Then I'm looking for, you know, can he hop, single hop, triple hop. Um, I'll often add uh, a little lateral hop or a side to side. Um, and then uh, lots of the scores talk about six meter timed or a crossover hop. I then want quiet knee 
with less than one instability episode since the original, preferably. Mm. Um, and then I normally run for a number of sort of psychological or global rating scores, um, which might be, uh, you know, ACL RSI, um, ACL quality of life, um, or the global rating score for knee function, which are pretty evidence-based for getting a battery of assessments that might give you an idea about whether that is potentially a COPA or, 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 or not. And what level, you play amateur football? Yeah. Is it 11 a side or 5 a side? It's 11 a side. 11 a side, so no scope for you playing football in a brace? Uh, not no. 11 a side? No. 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 So did you, would, you, would you consider using a brace in your non-operative treatments or? For me, it's all about, um, so if they were going to, skiing, I, I, I'd see skiing slightly different. Mm. Skiing, skiing sits in a different remit for me because things happen in a different way and, and, and braces are very easy to use when you're skiing and whatnot. And they're not necessarily indicated, but they work nicely. I think UK sport bracing isn't necessarily used that much. Mm. We know in the US it's a bit different. I'm not against it. I just think if Laddie felt that he needed that brace mm. to play football, um, he might not be scored, or there's potential that he's not going to score as high okay. as some of those measures that we just spoke about. And how did Laddie perform in his hops? Did he do it? Did he get that far? Or? Yeah, so so we've we've looked at some hop scores. Um, he's probably up and around 75, 80 percent, which is in the sort of Coca realm. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it is how he feels about that knee. So it's not just about how far he goes mm. um, or even how he lands, which is important. It's also about what do you feel when you do that task and are you confident to push that to your 100% currently? And I, I think as, as Laddie's um, already said, he feels that it's not quite where it needs to be. And, and we, I've scored him, I've looked at his strength, you know, he's pushing heavy weight on the leg press, open, open uh, chain knee extensions, he's pushing heavy. Mm but he doesn't feel that that knee will cope. And that's, that's a big factor, I think. So let's, let's just go outside our comfort zone for a little bit. So how do you feel about Laddie playing football, being treated non-operatively yep. for an ACL? So this is, this is a good question, and, and this is a difficult question because there isn't a lot out there to say those non-op or surgically versus each other going back to football about whether they cope. Now there is a little bit um, of research. It's, I think it's a handball that says um, there was no more OA, there was no more like meniscectomies. Um, and in terms of like pain and function, actually they scored very similarly, non-surgical or surgical. Mm. However, um, for Laddie specifically, um, I think if he's worried about his knee, then that makes him a risk. Um, and I like to be guided a little bit by how they feel, because as we know, those that score poorly on their psychological metrics mm. in terms of how you know their perceived instability are the ones that seem to either re-injure or re-rupture if they've had ACLs or, or perform bad. And a lot of people always say, oh, there's been these papers where this guy's got back to football and this guy's got to go back to skiing and won tournaments and stuff. And I'll say it's because you can quote the papers that are that rare. Yeah. So that's from a surgeon's perspective, because uh, I think you're bang on a brilliant candidate for non-operative treatment. And actually, the COVID pandemic, where I suspect you were cycling a lot and getting strong and doing some exercises, a bit remote or in person, has, has really shown you that living without an ACL is maybe not the end of the world, but you don't trust it to play football. Uh, which is the key determinant here for you to go down surgery. Um, and if I wanted to play football, that's what I would do because the risks of a pivot in a football match is that you tear other things. And we know that with chronic ACL injuries, you've got an increased chance of tearing your meniscus and those tears aren't often repairable. Yeah, I think that's the key. And, and we've spoke about this before is considering if Laddie does have a second injury mm. and he doesn't currently have an ACL, mm. the potential harm to his structures that are going to protect him long term is greater. We know that there's no there's no denying that. So there is always this this payoff about um, whether they're good to go non off or whether they you know if, if Laddie said to me you know actually I'm, I'm willing to consider maybe not playing as much football or some other sports um, that aren't pivoting. Then again, I think mm. we we start to guide them further down that non off route. Do you have family yet? Children or anything? Um, okay, so do you have any questions for me as a surgeon, not your surgeon, but any, you can ask me questions you don't want to ask your surgeon, but, or, or for Andy? Uh, no, I, I mean, 
one question. I had, I had a um, hip arthroscopy about four years ago. Okay. Could that be related? It's on that. It's on the same side as well. Yes, yeah, good question. So you had what? You had what? Hip impingement? Hip was yeah, it a debridement yeah. or a repair? Do you know? Uh, it was camelation debride. Did it? Were you in pain from it? Uh, yeah, so, so I was in pain pr prior and, and then um, about sort of nine months of rehab afterwards. Okay, so and how does it feel now? Uh, it's still, I, I can I can feel it when playing football, but I can't manage manage with it. It's no, it never actually stops me. So you got back to football after? Yeah. Okay. So if you were having impingement, it would it may have affected you in your rehab, having other alternative pains. But because that's been sorted now, and it's been a relative success, yeah? Yeah. Then I, I don't think there'll be much of an issue. Okay. But there are definite links with FAI, femoral acetabular impingement, the cam lesion you have, and knee pathologies. And that, and that literature is evolving. But so yes, it could have a role, but the fact you've done so much prehab now you're just going to be i'm fairly certain you're going to smash your rehab as well thank you you, you raise a nice point there's a final thing i want to say about laddie because um paul makes a really great point there you, laddie especially in the current situation with covid and whatnot he hasn't lost anything correct if anything he's only improved his chances post this acl reconstruction of doing really really well mm. because he's going in quite need lots of quad strength we know that those that go in with you know really down on their power do worse mm. and take longer so you know i'd expect that to do really well as a result of doing all of this prehab if you want to call it that yeah and i think from a surgical point of view you know people with isolated acl injuries they should have time and it should almost be mandatory that they undergo prehab yeah. and almost a trial of non-operative treatments Definitely. unless they're getting back to some of the things that we've discussed um, but even then, you've lost nothing by doing your exercise. Exactly. As long as you don't pivot. Great. Thank, Thank you, Laddie. Thanks. All right. Okay. Any questions? Um, so, yes, what we're going to do is we're just going to give them a little bit of time to change over patients uh, and also uh, prepare the area. So, we'll just do a few questions uh, while we're doing that. So, the question for Andy uh, in terms of non operative management, uh, do you follow any particular ACL procedure in terms of testing? Um, but, uh, as uh, you know, patients have ACL reconstruction, for example, the, the Melbourne ACL uh, protocol. What are your, what are your thoughts? Um, so, uh, Paul, yeah, okay. uh, so I, I don't tend to follow a particular um, protocol now because I see so many ACLs, but I would say I follow a blend of those. Um, the Melbourne protocol, by the way, is absolutely outstanding for those that um, you know want a basis around what they want to do. Um, I do follow lots of the the movements and the tests that they're using at Delaware Oslo group. So I would look at your sort of four types of hops. So I slightly modify the hops. So I would do single hops, triple hops. I tend to do a, a side to side hop and then I do a single leg counter movement jump just as that's a bit more knee specific. Um, I would definitely look at quad strength and hamstring strength. Uh, we have a handheld dynamometer in clinic. So I would use the handheld dynamometer to sort of compare one side to the other. Um, and then I would always be looking for, like we said, the, the quiet knee, the non-swollen, no effusion, very little pain as part of that. Um, and then I think it's really important for people to consider using as early as possible some of these psychological metrics that give us an idea about their beliefs and how they feel about the function of their knee. So I'm talking, you know, like I said, the ACL RSI, um, ACL quality of life uh, and, other, and other metrics that there are out there for that. So um, I use a blend is probably the best way to put it. Yeah, certainly been a lot of questions about uh, the patient's uh, input and psychological uh, input into that. So, yeah, thank you very much. That, that really answers it. I think we've perhaps uh, need to move on. Uh, so, what we'll do now is uh, we go straight over to the, to the second yeah, patient. Yeah, let me just grab the second patient. Okay, so we're just going to bring the second patient in um, and then we'll just explain a few different uh, features of, her, of his current situation. Uh, just That's not me. That. Um, so just right. go through the second. Obviously, we have different protocols because uh, of the COVID situation. So um, I'm going to pass over to them now, to just about information, um, and then we'll take it from there. Microphone. If you press the microphone. Yeah, I'll grab the microphone. So hi everyone. This is Lawrence. Lawrence, say hi. <laughs> Hello. Oh yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Hello. So Lawrence, tell everyone how old you are. Yeah. So I am 22 years old. And what's your job? Uh, currently a student at Royal Holloway, what are you studying saying? business. Business. And what sports do you do? So I do American football, rugby, and gym, I guess you would say. 
Okay, and tell everyone what you've had done. So this is my second ACL uh, for the, additionally, the meniscus uh, root and the lateral desis. Kinodesis. Yeah. Kinodesis, sorry. And we use your graft. From, yeah, we use the graft from the other leg as this is my second ACL, so the hamstring is taken from the left leg. And when did you tear your first ACL? So first ACL was torn about four to five years ago, uh, and this one was torn mid-February this year. And you had surgery on your first one done in? Uh, up in Leeds. In Leeds. Yep. And it went well, you got back to sport? Fantastic, yep. All and you good. did the first one, so you playing? Our first one was trampolining. Trampolining. Yeah. Sober? Yep, uh, not after. Not after. <laughs> so trampolining, ACL reconstruction, got back to sport, yep. re-ruptured in February. Yep, playing American football, and it was a contact fit. Okay, and you torn the meniscal roots yep. and the ACL, and we decided to go for tenodesis on yep. the outside. To secure the smooth yeah, do, do, do you know why we did that? Uh, I wasn't too sure. I just kind of was taking your advice on it. <laughs> Thanks for telling us. Okay, but it was to reduce the re-rupture rate. We discussed that, yeah? Okay. And um, so you had your surgery when? I had my surgery on the 1st of August this year. And that you waited because of? Yeah, unfortunately, due to COVID, I had it booked in just before, like I think it was the day that we went into lockdown. So unfortunate timing, but we what, are, we are. Was there any doubt in your mind about having surgery again? Not at all. There was no, uh, after the first one, I knew the surgery is like the only option really for considering the level of sport I want to get back into. So it was a must. Uh, and how did it feel this time around? Uh, much better. I think uh, down to really good staff as well. And uh, the fact that I had higher goals and expectations from the first time I tore it. Uh, I was 18 when I first did it. I wasn't playing sports properly. Uh, and I just did the rehab because I was taught to. Now, this time, I'm intending on going to America to play American football, so I need to keep up with like, my strength. So ACL uh, surgery was the only option, really. Okay. Do you understand how important the meniscus was for your injury this time? Uh, I understood that it was... I couldn't continue without having that repaired. Okay. Because the love of our well, Interesting to check. Why um, the meniscus root and... and What's the importance there? So um, talk a little bit about that. So the meniscus roots are a relatively new concept. Um, people, we, we tend to, we've, we've recently uh, uh, appreciated and there's been publications to show that the meniscus roots tears and ramp tears on the medial side can lead to ongoing instability. Yeah, and that's the key, isn't it? Yeah. Instability. And therefore the meniscus was contributing to his large pivot shift. It's why we did a tenodesis. And we need, he, he had good surgery first time, so we need to do something different. Uh, that's why we did a supplementary tenodesis. We discussed uh, graft choices and where we're going to take the grafts from, and they were all options were on the table here, patella tendon, quad tendon. It's, it's got a good physique for using those yeah. as well. We went for hamstring in the end with the tenodesis, but the key point here was we wanted to repair his meniscus. Yeah. And because of his pivoting sports, we were almost certainly going to go down the operative route. Yeah. And then, obviously, when we got back from lockdown, you were one of the first batches we did. Yeah. And you're now nine weeks post-op. Nine weeks post-op. So what have you... I'm going to quickly examine you, if that's yeah, all right, and then we'll, then we'll work out yeah. how those nine weeks have passed. Yeah. Andy's been your physio, hasn't he? Yeah, for the yeah. whole nine weeks. Yeah, yeah okay. the whole nine weeks. Perfect. Shall right. I? Yeah. Tell, tell us what you're looking at, Paul. Um, so, have a little go. I'll step outside and then... So the, fir the first thing I'm looking for here is swelling and whether the knee looks quiet or calm. There's no inflammation. His wounds have healed nicely. Uh, nine weeks isn't too long, but he's doing well. Tension quads for me on this one. The quads are coming on really nicely and relax. But if we do a little sweep test, it's got a little puff. Can you, can you see that, Ash? So if I sweep up and look on there, you can just see a little, a little bit of an effusion, okay? He's not got a patella tap. Then we're looking at extension, good on that side. And symmetric on this side, tense this quad for me, and then this one. Good, and lift this one up, straight in the air for me, and bend back for me as much as you can. Any pain? No pain. Okay, so remember you had a meniscal root, so deep flexion, weight bearing in particular, which we're limiting for a while, would be sore. No pain in the joint lines? Uh, there was at the start, but now no. And just bend this one back as much as you can. This one. And this one, just see how 
You're almost there. You, in fact, you are there fully, yeah? Are you on a Just bike? about. Are you on a bike? Yes. Yeah, every day. Okay. Relax. Let me know if it's uncomfortable. Nice and stable. Yeah? And a negative pivot. Okay, so... Um, so just to come in there, um, so we've got a positive sweep, which is fine. Mm. The, the key for me there is it's low level, which we both agree on, and the pain bit, that's, that's the bit I'm looking for. So I don't want that to increase, I normally say more than about a centimetre when I'm after training or whatnot, mm. um, but because he's doing so well, he's had quite a bit of surgery, I'm willing to tolerate a little effusion as long as quads are coming back well. Now, in an ideal world, I'd have that nice and quiet. Mm. Um, but for nine weeks, meniscal root, fairly happy with where he's at. Really good. Pain-free. So what have you got him doing? So we're going to run through. Tell me about your first four weeks. Yeah, so, um, I mean, uh, Lawrence can, can sort of talk a little bit about this, but we, the main things I spoke to Lawrence, and, and, I, and the key here is he wants to get back to a really high level. So... And, and he has pushed me to say that, what do you want me to do by next session? Four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, what should I expect? And that's what we've largely focused on. So first four weeks, I said to him, look, don't walk around too much. We want to get the swelling down. We want to get the swelling down, but we want it moving. Um, he had a brace. Um, we restricted flexion with the brace. Um, and he had lots of exercise to get those quads firing. Um, I asked him to purchase a muscle stim machine. We use Complex. And he also had a physio lab for ice. How did those two help? Uh, it, well, this time I used both of them and for the first surgery, I didn't use either of them. I, I can't express the, in, like, the improvement with the ice machine. Like that changed, that, that sped it up almost by two times, like double the recovery rate. And especially the convex, like the pads. At first, I didn't feel much benefit, but it was kind of then when we started like upping exercises to be more like quad based, then I was like, okay, I really do see the benefit of using them. So yeah, so ice compression, yep. uh, we all agree is a very, very 100%. good tool. Compex made a difference to you. Yep. So other, other tools we use, do you, did you use blood flow restriction? So for him, um, so I, blood flow restriction, I think in the load compromised patient is, is, is brilliant. And because Lawrence was, you know, he was up and about and walking relatively well, and he wasn't going to have BFR at home, for me, I prioritised get the swelling down, use the complex and get him a bit more active. And luckily, he has a bike available to him and all these things. So we sort of prioritised exercise. But say he'd had um, like a chondral uh, sur surgical surgery that meant he was like partial weight burn Correct. or something like yeah. those, then BFR would have kind of moved up the list for, for me. Anyway. And that's where I see the role as well in plateau fractures, somewhere where we're not uh, allowing full weight bearing. Uh, two points I want to raise yeah. uh, two controversial points one is how much physio did you have in your first two weeks first two weeks i saw i think it was two three days after surgery or four days possibly i think it was four days four yeah. days and then it was every week from so, that day so two times in the first or maybe yeah. three just so we had two two a week for the first two weeks that i saw it yeah. Um, and then we went down to one a week because Lawrence obviously got travel and he's at the union and all that stuff. So we've gone down and now we're at, um, every other week. Okay. But the first bit was key. And I said to him, look, I know it's a pain for you to get here, but we want that nice and quiet so you can exercise. You're going to come a couple of times. And so, because the reason I say that, because there's some physios who believe, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna see you, go and see Mr. Tricker at two weeks and I'll book the first appointment in. And for me, I, I said to my patients, I want three sessions in the first two weeks minimum, if they can, ideally three, if not two. Yeah. What are your feelings on the first few weeks after surgery? So I just think, um, and I said this to Lawrence, I said, look, you're in a brace, you've got pain, you've got swelling, you've got wounds that are, that are healing, but there's a lot of stuff we can do that sets us up for when that goes down. So we did, you know, let's optimize the calf, let's get the glute working, let's get the quads firing, let me help you get the swelling down, let me help you with the range. And also, I know in between your appointment with you, hmm. if that looks red and angry and swollen, I can say, you've seen me, look, you need to see Paul because there's something going on with a stitch or a wound or whatnot. And that's, that's I, I think that's a bit underplayed, that little catch for them to know that if something's not right, I am gonna be telling you it's not right and yeah. we're gonna catch that early. Um, and you know, if he has to wait for two weeks and he's got a little stitch, little wound infection, hmm. and that's, you know, maybe he does, he's not sure, then we start to get problems and equally, I know that at two or three weeks, his quads were better 
way better. Mm. And his walking was nigh on normal by you know the end of the second week. Um, and he had no 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 need for crutches at that point. Um, he was in a brace still, obviously, but he's, um, that puts him ahead. Mm. And he wants to play really decent level American football. And we've got a bit of a timeline. And let's try and optimise him at starts. My thought process. Yeah, and this is important because all three of us were aligned. I yeah. wanted you to have lots of physio. He yeah. wanted to give you lots of physio, and you wanted I to wanted move to on. Physio. So if one of us is 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 out of line there, like the, the physio you see doesn't want to see you for the first two weeks, we're struggling. Yeah. And some people, I don't know what, I have strong opinions on physio, particularly after knee replacements and ligaments to be done early. Yeah. Okay, second question is revision ACL, meniscal root, lateral tenodesis. Ads, can you just come in and show the scar on the outside here? Oh, just about, just around that side. Actually. And, um, so what I'm going to ask now is, because someone will have asked this question, open chain, closed chain, nine weeks. How much, what, what's been the, the mix? Have you done any open chain? Yeah, so um, from my perspective, um, from my perspective, there's, there's no reason to delay as long as you do it in the right way. So from my perspective, and I've said this to you before, I would go open chain as early as possible. I wouldn't go heavy and hard because we need to respect that that's, there needs to be some healing and settling. Um, but I think you should be doing open chain immediately because mm -hmm. there's plenty of research that says quads are king. And if you're not doing open chain, there's plenty of stuff that shows that you probably can't get all of your quad strength at the level that he wants to perform at if you don't do open chain. So for me, the things were settle, settle the fat pad, settle the front of the knee down as much as possible. Because if you start whacking into open uh, chain knee extension in the wrong range with a bit of an angry front of the knee, you can reassure yourself that you're going to keep an angry front of the knee. So we had a stage progression. You know, we started moving it, no resistance, just through range, just nicely controlled very early. And then in terms of isometrics, we started to bring them in around four weeks where we started to push against the other leg or a band. And then nine weeks now, he's moving through a little bit of range. He's not quite full. We're not going into that top part because we've discussed that. Uh, the top end of the range, like 30 to zero, but he's moving through range against a little bit light resistance and just casually building those quads without pain um, and making sure that we had good quad function before we started against any form of resistance. Just on a really basic level, just in case his patients or junior doctors watching, difference between open and closed chain? Yeah, so um, closed chain being foot on ground, yeah. open chain being I'm sitting on a chair, foot is in the air, moving through uh, knee extension and flexion. And some of the, the debate is based on traditional literature saying between 45 and 80 degrees, 90 degrees, hamstring grass are susceptible to shear, which is why surgeons have always said, no open chain, no open chain, no open chain. But then yeah. we've moved on a little bit from there, I think. So. Yeah, we certainly have. And, and there are studies that show, you know, if you're going to let your patient walk, then open chain has less shear than walking. So if you're going to stop him walking, um, or sorry, you're going to allow him to walk, then you probably need to allow him to do some open chain, as long as you grade it appropriately, and that's the key. Okay, so let's just stand up for me. If I just go back a little bit and just face the we put the microphone down and just face the camera. Okay, and just roll your shorts up a little bit, both of them. So nine weeks, just ten your quads. Okay, and do a, a squat to ninety. No, no, no over ninety. A little bit lower. No, no pain. No pain. Okay, stand up and turn and face the screen and go back down again. Okay, good. Did you have any problems with the tenodesis wound at the beginning? Was it? At uh, the beginning, it was really tight. Yeah. I think that's the best way to describe it. Yeah. Uh, I took, after, I'd say, three weeks, it started just to ease on itself. I think it was just healing itself. Okay, good. Um, any questions for Lawrence? Or uh, no? Or about two questions no, for Lawrence. Uh, there, was, there was one actually a few. Uh, Thanks very much. Um, so could you tell, talk to us a little bit about your decision making with regards to your glass size and, and how you Okay, so for those, there's lots of graft choices available nowadays, hamstrings, uh, patella tendon, quads tendon, allograft. I don't think there's much scope for discussing synthetics for ACL surgery. Um, so we, in him, he's a good candidate. So for all grafts, uh, but not allograft, he's still young. I think prefer allograft for, for older patients with less function, he's going to explosively pivot in American football and rugby. 
So, and there's a higher rerupture, higher rerupture rate with allograft. Patella tendon versus quad tendon versus hamstrings is a debate and there's a resurgence in quads tendon, but then there's a Scandinavian paper showing slightly higher re-rupture rates. So people are looking at those quite closely. The patella tendon versus the hamstring tendon is an aged old debate. And it's, I can't believe since ACLs were introduced, the that debate will continue. Probably the, the patella tendon is the stronger graph, but slightly increased morbidity and we weigh these up in a sports specific guide. So a sprinter might not lose his hamstrings. Yeah, so that's a, a very baseline level. So we discussed with the patients and if he came in wanting a quad tendon graft and he's informed, we would do that. So, and I think most ACL surgeons, I hope nowadays are able to offer all of those as options. I don't know, do you have a strong opinion in when you rehab patella tendons versus quad tendons versus hamstrings, do you have a stronger no, um, I, I think that the key bit I would say from a physiotherapy perspective is the start is different. So, you know, you might find that the quads are going to be more inhibited with a quad or a patella tendon at the start. So, mm. and, and that's probably due to pain and where the donor site is from. So you need to sort of respect that a little bit. And, and I would say for them, complex is key. You need to stim that quad. Um, uh, and, and you may consider with them, BFR might come in because you want to do low load and get that quad working. In the UK, I see way more hamstring than I see um, than I see patella tendon. I don't see too many quad tendons at, at present, but you know, I've seen some. Um, I, I don't think there's too much argument. You know, the research is a bit equivocal. I'd say about whether one is better than the other. Like you say, there might be a lean towards patella tendon, but if it's a good surgeon and a good surgery and good rehab, yeah, I think that's that's what the difference is. Uh, brilliant answer. Um, just while we get the next patient in, uh, just wondering um, if you had an ACL patient uh, who was the high level uh, in sport, would you see them with the same level of frequency perhaps at the, the early stages or would you modify that slightly? Uh, yeah, so um, I think it, it depends on, or, on the person, but I think at the start, the start is key. So you might say um, you're going to definitely see them weekly for certain, but for me, you don't get many people that would regard themselves as low, low level that are going for this surgery. They're normally people that want to play sport. And yes, all right, Lawrence wants to play at a very good level of American football. Um, but, you know, what's to say that, you know, Paul, uh, who wants to play football, um, doesn't regard himself that that's just as important. So I think it's more about the result I think I'll get if I make sure they're in a good place and we make sure we get on top of it. We're not doing anything we shouldn't do and we're making sure we load it appropriately. So. I, the frequency, I think, it would be relatively similar. Mm -hmm. um, I do think he's progressing at a very good rate because of his natural kind of, um, sort of genetic ability. And, and, and yeah. his... Fantastic. So uh, we'll just bring the next patient in. Um, so just going to uh, swap over to there. Um, so just bring, uh, bringing her in. Uh, just getting yeah, sorted. Obviously, we have to have her transfer and a cleaning uh, for that procedure. So we've done the cleaning part already. Um, so just go back to them uh, yeah. and then we'll the, the third patient. Right, so I'm just going to pop some gloves on. So um, this is Fleur. Um, Fleur, I believe you're, what, seven months, I think. Um, and you've got a very, very good uh, physiotherapist in Glenn Robbins, who I, I know well. Um, I want to have a little look at your knee. Um, whilst I have a little look, could you tell us um, what you've had done to your knee, is that okay? Yeah, so I've had an ACL repair and then ball reconstruction with a lateral tenodesis and then some stitches in my meniscus because I had a slight fissure, which, um, and then, yeah. I think that's Fine, it. yeah, great, okay. Um, we'll talk about um, the lateral tenodesis a little bit for you and why we feel it's important for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just gonna have a little look. So initially what I'm looking for is extension and we can see uh, Fleur, as if you can have a little see of this, you'll see that uh, Fleur has hyperextension, quite a lot of it. Um, would you show me the bending on this leg? Full forward, give it a little bit extra. That's great. And you can see she's got full, full flexion. And show me this side. How does, does that feel similar to that? Uh, slightly different. Slightly different. Any pain that stops you when you do that? No pain, just a different end feel. A different end feel, okay. And when you pull it towards you, do you feel there's a bit more play in there? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit, okay, fine. And then we drop that down. Okay, um, as we can see, a nice small wound uh, for the lateral tenodesis. This is the bit I find that people can be a little worried about, especially um, those that are in performing arts um, or dance. 
um, because this is quite a visual scar compared to some of the mm -hmm. uh, the ones that are at the front. Was that ever a consideration for you uh, about yeah. the, the scar? Yeah, so if I could have had the patella tendon graft, but Paul decided to do uh, the hamstring graft with the lateral synesthesis, but that also was important for like modeling and things like that, because I just thought small thing. Okay, fair enough. Um, we can see that there is no swelling or effusion when we do a sweep test, which is nice. Uh, and then can I ask you to tense both of your fine muscles? And as we can see, that just demonstrates um, the hyperextension there. Um, and rest, I'm gonna ask you to go one more time. If we just zoom on the quads, if that's right, Ash, just go again for me. What you'll see is pretty good volume. Um, I would say there's a little bit more quads to get on that side, but we know that um, you've been interrupted with COVID and whatnot, and, mm -hmm. and exercise has been challenging. Okay, um, Paul, do you wanna have a little look? Yeah, so if you stand up for me. And just face ads for me. And just stand tall. And then hyper, yeah, hyper set, push your knees back for me. Really good. And just put your feet together. And squat down. All the way, good. And up. And if you turn and face me. Okay, and then squat down again. All the way down. Yeah, perfect. How's that feel down there? Um, I mean, I have a tendency to go to my right side. Yeah, okay, good. Pop yourself on the bed. So, I just want to go through some of the decision making, if that's all right. So, so Fleur, how old are you? 22. 23. And what's your job? Uh, I'm a third year physiotherapist. Student. So, you're going to be a physio? Mm -hmm. And in your final year? Yeah. Perfect. And what did you do before that? Um, I was a sports model and um, gymnast, so I was an elite gymnast before. Um, and I used that to do modeling, so it was important. But you're an elite level. Yeah. and your sports model. Mm -hmm. So when we discussed, I remember our conversation well when you came to see me, yeah. what was the, can you remember the discussion we had um, about what we were going to do and about that tenodesis in particular? Yeah, so the tenodesis was so that I could um, try and return to those kind of sports because I had a lot more laxity than most people. Yeah. Um, and was there, was there any doubt with your modelling whether you were going to have the tenodesis? Um, I mean, I did not want you to do the patella tendon because I was worried then, like, when I do more thing and stuff, I wouldn't be able to see it. So, yeah. But. And did, did you do the lapman? Uh, I did that. Nothing. And, does, and how do you think your rehab's gone? Um, it's gone well. It was hard because I had um, COVID, like the COVID lockdown within kind of, I think it was three weeks following my surgery. So it was, um, I was doing Skype calls with my physio, which was really good. But then I had the complex, which was also helpful because he could teach me what settings to put it on. And I did that at home, but um, I mean, a little bit slower, but uh, I was motivated, so. And you had a CTI ACL brace, didn't you? Mm -hmm. And was that helpful at the beginning? Yeah, that gave me a lot more confidence. So like being able to do my movements without my physio being there to watch me as well. Okay, and you use ice compression mm -hmm. as it's well. And how did that make a big difference? Yeah, a massive difference. Um, gave me massive pain relief and reduced the swelling. Yeah, like And what can you do now? Um, can you run? Yeah, I can run, I can, I can- Jump? Yeah, I can kind of do whatever I want if I'm clever and safe. And, and you go to the gym a lot? Yeah. And you do lots of physio. And what about, how, how are you with gymnastics? Are you- um, I'm trying and doing as much as I can. I, the only thing I wouldn't be doing at the moment is like, movements with a lot of velocity, like trampolining yes. or any kind of like things with a lot of velocity where I just don't have the support in my knee. But and you injured your knee skiing, didn't you? That was not in gymnastics or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, skiing. So, tenodesis, do you want to discuss tenodesis? Yeah, let's discuss it. Um, uh, did you demonstrate the hyperlaxity in standing? I did. I didn't do the, she's got a full beta and nine out of nine yeah, so, hyperlaxity. Yeah, so yes, fine, that's, that's what we're talking about. So yeah, she's got a full, the full score, which, uh, mm -hmm. which is important. Okay, so, why, um, why for Fleur would you sort of push for that tenodesis specifically given the background that we've just spoke about? Yeah, so obviously a difficult conversation with her being a sports model yeah. about doing an extra procedure where, where, the re where your revision rates are fairly low to start with. Um, but she knows that the, the addition of a lateral tenodesis mm -hmm. can up to half your re-rupture rate, if not more. Yeah. Uh, the stability trial in um, Alan Getgood's paper, you can look it up on our Instagrams, I think, yep. um, showed a reduction of um, re revision rates from 11% to 4%. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so who gets it? Young, the young, all children, all young adults, for me under 25. Hyperlaxity, um, explosive pivoting sports, yeah. additional uh, um, ACL plus, ACL plus. So in her meniscal tear, that's going to cause further instability. Yeah. That degree of hyperlaxity. Increased tibial slope on the okay. scans. Does alignment change anything for you? Yeah, so her landing, she's a touch varus actually, um, but you know, the way she lands and goes into valgus would be a, a key assessment tool when we're examining the patient. But slope, tibial slope, and additional injuries, and all revisions as we did with Lawrence. Yeah. Okay. So she fulfills all of those apart from the revision, yeah. touch wood. And, um, yeah. and yeah, so that's why I think is. Very straightforward decision for, um, yeah. for that. I didn't think you thought too much about the cosmetics, but we did obviously. Yeah. She did try and ask me to make it as small as possible and neat as possible, but yeah, it's the Correct. same with everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're talking end stage pretty much or, or mid to end stage with Fleur. Um, in terms of the rehab, we, uh, we asked Fleur and she's doing strength work by the sounds of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's been challenging, obviously, with COVID to get to the gym, but now you're back into the gym, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, you've done some hopping, done some running, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I've seen you skipping on your Instagram, so I know you're doing some sort of plyometric work. Yeah. Um, talk, I'm just interested very briefly about how you found rehabbing in the kind of current climate, because um, like I've been talking a lot about the sort of psychology aspect of it. Um, how have you found, like, what was that rehab like? It was harder. It was made easier by the fact I was able, to, my physiotherapist was able to do um, like Zoom meetings like the with virtual me. Sun. And I had the compact, so it was like, and the brace. So it was like something additional to just me and my mat and my home weights. Um, it was hard and a bit more challenging, but then it's also made me appreciate now that we have the gyms and everything like that. So I'm going a lot more. Okay, great. So I'm really keen now to get into gym with Fleur yeah, and show let's, that let's, and what yeah. we're going to try and demonstrate is so Andy's not met Fleur yeah. as a, he's met her, but not as a patient. So I want to see what, what he would do with you at seven months and how he, how he assesses you on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. So if, if we get you up and we're going to go through to the gym. So if I, if I get you here, um, so Normally what I would look for is I would have a measure of Fleur's uh, muscle girth. So I'd want to see, um, does the thigh look a similar size? And without a tape, um, we can measure that. It does look like there's a small, it does look like there's a smaller size. Um, if I turn you to the side, Fleur, um, can I ask you to do a little bit of a single leg squat? On my right leg? Uh, we'll go right leg, yeah. Comfortable range, whatever you're happy with. Okay, and then we're going to do one on the other side, if that's all right. And I'm going to ask her, how do you feel about the single leg squat on that side compared to the other side? Is there a difference in how you feel confidence-wise or potentially strength-wise? Yeah, confidence. Just, this one's different. Just feels different. Yeah. Okay, fine. Um, and if you were to do, maybe take a couple of steps backwards and then you're just going to do a little lunge forwards and just tell me how you feel with a couple of lunges. We're going to alternate, so right then left. Does that make any difference? Um, the control force is quite good and still... So in that deeper range, that feels a bit different. Andy, can we do a face in one of the cameras, do that? Yep. So what I'm looking for here is, you know, how does she feel? How, how does it feel? But also, is she able to control where that knee goes? Does it Go. dip into valves at all? Yeah. Uh, which um, is important thing to take into account. Okay, Fleur, let's have you back here, if that's all right. Um, I just want you to do a little bit of a jump on the spot yeah. and land for me. Um, we'll do it facing the camera, if that's all right. Okay, and then uh, can I get you to do another one? Another? Yep. Okay. Good. All right. And then could I get you to do a little hop on the spot? So we're just going to stand on one leg and we're just going to do a little hop and land. Yep. Yep, we'll do one and then the other. That's right. Right side. <laughs> Okay, so there's a little fall into valves well, guess, yeah. on, on both sides. Um, I think the confidence is a little bit less when you land on that one. That you, like, even though you went uh, valgus on the right side, actually when you went valgus on the left side, that didn't make you feel too good by the looks of things. Okay, so I know she can jump, I know she can hop. Don't think there was any pain. 
no fine. So then I'd look to go uh, horizontally. So um, if I get you from that line, you're going to single leg, you're just gonna take a small hop forwards and I want you to land. I want you to go a comfortable distance to start with because it's the first one we've done. Okay, good. Reset, go one more on that side for me. Okay, and then can we have a little look at the other side? Same thing, it's gotta be a distance you're happy with. Okay. How do you feel confidence-wise with that? I feel a little bit under pressure. A little bit under pressure, sorry. That's, that's probably me talking quickly. Um, we're gonna go one more on that. Really nail that landing for me if you can. Yeah. Okay, great, that's perfect, that absolutely uh, nailed it. Now, what I'd also look at here normally is I'd get Fleur to do that um, from a side angle, and I'd be looking with a camera, quite similar to our setup, I'd get her to hop, I'm not gonna make you do that yet, and what I would do is get it on slow-mo, I'd probably use an app like Huddle Technique, and I'd be looking for knee flexion angle when she lands. Is that similar? Is she using her hip more than she's using her quad? Um, we're gonna go towards again. We'll take a little bit of a, a further. If I get you down here, Fleur, we're gonna go one, two, three this time, okay? So one, two, third one, we've got to land. Uh, we're gonna go right, and then we're gonna go left, um, and comfortable still, because I want you to land. Right, 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 reset, left, left, left. Okay, good. One more on that one. In terms of how far you think you could go, I'm not gonna make you necessarily go maximal right now, but how, do you think you got more in the tank? Yeah. Lovely, and then we're gonna go left side. Um, lay down a marker like we did for the first one. So we're gonna go nice and comfortable. We've got to land the last one on the left side. Okay, okay fine. Now, you're, well you're pushing the distance and we've got a little bit of room, but talk to me about how that felt at the end there on the landing. Did that feel different to the right and the left? Yeah, it's just like, I just feel more confident. That more confident, yeah. Specific. Yeah, fine. And, and I think we've had a few little hop forwards. Yeah. Uh, and then, to me, it looks like there's a little wiggle yeah. when you land, um, which could be, you know, that could be quad strength, could be a number of things. Um, I then want to look at, can she hop on a single leg in a few different yeah. directions? So. I'm going to use this line. Um, Flo, if I get you to stand in front of the line, I'm just going to get you to go forwards and backwards over this line a few times. Um, at speed that you're happy with, if you can go quick, go quick, but you've got to be in control. Right leg first. Yep. Okay, nice. Can we do that on the left one? So here I'm looking for velocity. I'm looking for how she hops as well. Yeah. And I'm also going to ask her how she feels when she stops. Okay, how to stop. How did that feel? Um, less powerful. But... Less powerful. Great. Okay. Um, facing me, we're going to go side to side over the line. Uh, we'll go. We'll go left one if that's okay. So here, uh, have a rest. Uh, here I'm also looking at accuracy. Now I know, I know you haven't done loads and loads of laterals. You've done some, but not loads. Yeah. Uh, but I'm looking for, can you make over the line each time? Are you, have you got skill at doing the task? Now I know this is, I've kind of put you on the spot here, so it's a little bit unfair. Um, but that's what I'd be judging you against. And I'm going to skip the right side on this one just for time. But what I am going to ask you to do now, do you remember the one, two, three, four? Yeah. Uh, we're going to just have a little look at that. On the left? On the left. So what I'm asking her to do here, if you imagine a box on the floor, she's going from number one box, number two box, number three box to number four, uh, and have a rest. Mm -hmm. Now we will compare that to the right, have a little breather for a second. We're gonna compare that to the right. I still want you to think accuracy as well as performing the task. So you still want to go over the line if you can. <laughs> Fatiguing? I know, okay. So let's... There's a, just a quick question. If, if you have got a patient uh, who's a little bit reluctant perhaps to, to, to do some of these procedures, hopping, for yeah. example, are there any sort of techniques that you'd employ in order to help with that and support the patient with it? Yeah, so uh, I, I start wherever they, wherever they can. So we might, if, if this was very early and there was a difficulty, Flo hadn't done a lot of this, we might start with simple, just getting ready to take load. We might start with simple on one leg, just getting ready to take load. We might start with just little hop and stops, as I call them, just getting ready. 
And I'd always lead them in. Now, I'd never start here. Me and Fleur discussed that this is something she has done some side to side. I wouldn't start here. This is something we'd have practiced a few times before I'd ask her to nail this. Um, okay, I tell you, let's have a look at one, two, three, four, just on the right side, just as a quick comparison. I'm looking for accuracy again, if we can. And already most of them clear the line. And she's just a little more consistent. Have a rest. Okay, fine. Now you are getting a little I bit thought she's better. You're, she's better on the other. <laughs> Operating now, I fine. think. Um, now, the final thing I'd want to look at, and as I said earlier, is vertical jump height. Yeah. So the reason I want to see vertical jump height is because with the forwards hops, um, you can use more of your hip on the landing. You can scoot along the floor, not get quite as high. You can change the technique. Now, you can't cheat that on a vertical jump. Um, we're going to come over to the mat over here, if that's okay. And um, just pull this out a little. Um, we'll go facing out for you. Um, now, this is the jump mat that we use in clinic. Um, I'll tell you when to go. Um, what all I'm going to ask you to do is uh, just step off for a second. Uh, good. And then you're going to step on. And then you're going to pop your hands on your hips. Your hands are going to stay on your hips the whole time. And it's a single leg jump and land. And you've got to stick the landing. Don't step off for me, if that's okay. Yep, yeah. yeah, when you're ready. Right leg. Good. Now the key there, have a rest. The key there is if I'm going to get them to do a counter movement jump, I don't want them to tuck when they're in there. Yeah. I want a pure score of vertical jump height. So that was pretty good. Let's, can we have a little look at the left? Not bad. Pretty good, and the stick was good too. Um, having a look at her score, she's a little bit down, but I'd expect her to be down. She hasn't practiced lots of vertical jump. And this is one of those things uh, that we would bring in later down the line, um, but I would practice elements of vertical jump as we go forward. That, sorry, go on. Yeah, go. Take, let's imagine, say, I notice a couple of things. Every time she jumps or lands and nails a hop, she hyperextends her yep. knee. Yep. The other thing she does is she drifts into valgus yep. a little bit. At what point are you trying to adjust these or are you in someone like her? Because the hyperextension is what she does. I think that's uh, That's her gymnastics move. Some of her sports modeling involves positioning like that, particularly on the trampolines and things. So how important is, and you've got it back, yeah. you have. I've worried about not getting it back. And are you happy you've got it back? Yeah, but then now it's controlling it. Yeah. That's the key. So, so in terms of modifying it, I think, Fleur needs it to perform, so she just needs better control of it. And at this stage, you know, we're going for a little battery, just giving me an idea about where she sits in this rehab plan. And I'm looking at this saying, you know, I haven't tested her strength yet. We would normally sit down and test her strength, but I'm saying, look, she's moving relatively well. There's a little bit of loss of control in certain areas. I do think there's a little bit of a quad deficit that she probably needs mm. to work on. Um, there's certainly a power deficit that I'd expect at this stage she's not at return to, you know, which she's not in the nine to 12 month barometer where we'd be saying actually she's nearly ready, um, which isn't a time criteria, but I wouldn't let them return before nine months. So you don't think she's ready right now? If she comes in and goes, I'm a pushy gymnast, mm -hmm. high level, I've got to compete, I've got to train, what are you, how is that conversation going? So she's doing well. Yeah, no, she's doing great. Yeah. Um, and for me, it would be what are we, so if she's going to go back to say a shoot or what um, a modeling, gig for instance mm. what will you be doing in that particular session mm. and working out if that is a risk because there might be elements of her work her job her her dance and whatnot that she can absolutely go back to now yeah. but if she was going to ask me whether she could do a high velocity turn pivot change of direction i'd say fleur do you feel ready for that have you done enough to feel confident at a high velocity turn cut pivot and have you practiced it and i just don't think she's ready for that high velocity turn and power movement watching what's happening with her knee and the control of her knee into valves and hyperextension right now and how, how are you going to help in terms of education in terms of her going into valgus because to prevent recurrence that's the key and to your other knee with, you know that's the... yeah, so I, I wouldn't necessarily prevent yeah. I, I i would want her to have uh, control and ability and probably better strength in the other direction you know, external rotators, hip strength, control, and the ability, landing accuracy and ability with some of these tasks to sort of give her a better sense of, 
ability with these movements mm. as such. So I wouldn't want her to think she can never go into valgus because that, that's, that's a problem in itself, and yeah. especially for something she might need to do. Uh, and valgus isn't a dangerous motion, mm. but she needs to be much stronger and, and more controlled and have the ability to go there and, and be in a good controlled position and not wobble. That, that's what I'm really looking yeah. for. So she's seven months now. Yep. So if, 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 if Flo or similar was, was your patient now, what's your next few months looking like with her? Yeah, so I think um, the key here would be, Flo, what single leg strengthening are you doing? Are you doing knee extensions, open chain, heavy? Are you doing single leg pressing? How much posterior chain work are we doing? Are we going single leg? You know, um, I'd really want to start to look at power movements and hopping and control movements, but I would start, you know, relatively um, easier on that. I'm not going to ask her to do an absolute maximum triple hop as an exercise, for instance, but I might ask her to start doing some vertical jumps onto a box, start doing some little hurdle jumps, maybe straight lines to start with some, some of the hopping movement style that we're already doing. But for her, looking at her right now, I do think she needs at least another four or six weeks of proper heavy strength work to really okay. get her when it, where she needs to be. And that's... Supervised by you or gym work for her both? I think, um, you know, Fleur's knows the gym. Um, there might be some movements that she wants some coaching in. So, for instance, it might be a, you know, kickstand deadlift, for instance, or, you know, heavy, heavy squat, heavy step-ups, that sort of stuff. I know Fleur mentioned to me that the barbell isn't somewhere where she's necessarily comfortable mm. present. So it might say, okay... What isn't comfortable for you? Can I coach you in that? And I, I don't think Fleur's going to need a lot of, you don't need to see me weekly, for instance, but we might need to check in every three or four. How are you? How's it going? What reps are you doing? What's your maximums? What should, what should jump scores or whatever we put in place to say, where are you at? And this is the bit where goal setting is so important because it's easy for Fleur to drift and go, go into the gym two or three times, I'm doing my deadlifts, I'm doing my squats, I'm doing my lunges, I'm doing my step-ups, I'm doing my hops. How much better have you got? Well, I'm doing all right, I'm kind of pushing it a little bit. What are we aiming for? Well, I'm just trying to get a little bit stronger. I'm trying. Mm. That's the issue, and I know Glenn won't be doing that, but mm. um, okay, right. For instance, single leg press, I want you to hit 1.5 times your body weight by the end of this. Where are you at? I'm at 60, for instance, mm. okay? I want you to be over your body weight in two or three weeks. These sorts of things, I think these are the metrics that are important here. Um, and I would also be going through some of those psychological scores we were talking about before. I seem to be banging on about this quite a lot, but I would have want to be going through that because I'd want to know where Fleur's mind is at compared to six months, three months, day one. Because I can say, if she walks in and says, I don't feel like I'm getting better, and I say, well, I look at this score and you're not worried about X, Y, Z, your confidence has improved, your single leg press has improved, your knee extension's improved. Why don't you feel like you're improved? Yeah. We start, to, we start to build a picture about where Fleur needs to go to get back to the sport she wants. But you, she really struggled psychologically at the beginning. Mm. Really did. And once you began to regain that movement, I think your hyperextension, getting that back, was a, a major yeah. trigger for you to be happy again. Yeah, I think and, it was happy. And, you, and you never looked back. And so I suppose what I'm trying to get at is just kneel down, squat down. Yeah. Come, come off that mat, that'll be a little uncomfortable. Yeah. Let's, let's go yeah, on. Don't know, let's go you, you were doing it earlier, all the way back, sit back on your haunches, stand to unrestricted deep flexion. There's not much more she can get. Yeah. But we did notice a clinical lag on the bed. Yeah. Stand up. Okay, and just turn and face one of these cameras. Just start, just high, log, high, leg, high leg jog, so high knees. Okay, and if, have you sprinted? Yeah. You can stop. So you've sprinted and suddenly stopped, or just sprinted and slowly stopped? So you, you've, you've sprinted and, and... I've just been doing like, I go on a run and I will give myself 10 second sprints throughout. So what, what you're getting at is, it's has there been any sort of specific acceleration, deceleration yeah. drills, you know, those quick... Yeah. Can you bias the, the ACL leg just as much as the non-op, that's what you're saying. Yeah, and I'm also trying to get at the patients that are going to come and see people and... Because what we haven't talked about is, I think you're better than seven months. I quite think... but. What we're, what we're moving on from is not even talking about time. Mm -hmm. You're not ready. Mm -hmm. That's the key. It's not because you're seven months. Yeah. You could have scored highly and you'd be ready. That's, that's the, mm -hmm. and it's a subtle examination, the subtle things you're looking for yeah. that tell. Because a lot of patients go, yeah, I'll go to the gym, I'll get strong at nine months or 12 months and playing. Yeah, yeah. And, How do you and, deal with those guys? So for me, it's all, look, um, 
when you're ready, you're ready. If you hit the markers, hit the scores, and you look good, when, like, as in the, the physical capabilities look, look solid, look good, then you're ready, as long as you're greater than nine months. And the only reason for that is the re-rupture rate is very significantly higher below nine months. So for me, that's part of the criteria. Um, but I would be saying to Flo, look, you're seven months, you're doing really well, your quads are doing nicely, you're moving relatively well. You know, you've got a lot of physical things that make it harder for you to control it, which is why you're so capable in what you want to do, which is a, an advantage, but sometimes a little bit of a disadvantage when you're rehabbing, yeah. um, slightly. No, um, no. Uh, so what I would be wanting here is to say, look, this is where I want you to be at nine. This mm. is where I want you to be at 12. And, but actually, Flo, this is what you could go and do. This is what you could go and do. This is what you could go and mm. do. Because it's about that positive spin as well. And, you know, you, she's back to running. She's already doing some sprinting. Okay, mm. great. How can we maximize that? Can we get a bit more? Can we do some slowdown speed ups? Can we do some intervals? Yeah. Okay. And, and, and just modifying it to get the best of, you know, the next. And, and probably for her, in terms of the modeling and the shoots and whatnot, she might be very close for some stuff. Mm. But in terms of the skiing, which I know is where Fleur did it, we've got a bit of a way to go. And that's, and that's the thing. It's working out what she can do now and what maybe we need to just work towards. But she skis, skis in Switzerland next year for the brace, maybe? Yeah, I mean, again, if she's ready, she's ready. Yeah. Um, and for me, I'd, you know, I'd expect, and I, and I think she's very driven and motivated, and I know Glenn's doing excellent physio, mm. so I expect that she probably will be ready, yeah. Um, do you think being a physio yourself has helped or hindered or it hindered me at the start because i thought oh my god this is horrific like yeah. i don't know how my patients have done it um can, can, can you hear can you yeah. hear me yeah, yeah. Sorry. but um now it can be helpful because it also i think means when i go to a physiotherapy appointment or when i have expectations they're realistic and i kind of i understand like how to set like time bound goals and everything so okay. it is helpful yeah. okay so do you have any questions for andy or physio wise or is there anything you say can I do this or can I not do this or um what would you say to a patient who's like not getting their full uh, flexion back and like how would do you, is that realistic that a lot of people don't get their full flexion back so I think it depends on the surgery that you've had so it it is more common with to get a bit of a flexion res resistance post a meniscal repair I would say mm -hmm. um so if you was a I say ACL non-meniscal repair and other bits and pieces, you know, maybe a, a tenodesis for instance, I'd expect you to get full flexion and we'd push for it. Mm -hmm. um, in, in this instance, I'd say, oh, I think you will get full, full flexion. You might, you might have a couple of degrees that you don't notice, but I think looking at your yeah. passive, you will get there. Um, but in most people that don't need the range that you've got, they probably wouldn't notice that, but, but you will because of that. So I think with your passive range getting to where you are, you will get the flexion that you desire. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd reassure them that yeah, for most, it's not required as much as people. And for four months, you did no deep squats. Yeah, yeah of course. So you've done well. Yeah, yeah so three, you've only had three months of squats and you've done that, which, yeah. is, which is what I was demonstrating there. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Anything else? No, it's fine. All right, thank you very much. So we're going to move on to our final patient. I'll take that. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Fleur. Thank you. Sorry. So a little bit over time, apologies about that. So uh, we're just going to pass over, we've prepped the room uh, and for the next patient. So final patient this evening, just to go over the yeah, yeah, you can have a look at me. Yep. Hi Paddy. Hi. Hi everyone. So this is Paddy. Uh, Paddy's one of my patients. And Paddy, let's just start with a few basic questions if you don't mind. So can you tell everyone how old you are? I'm 73. And you came to see me with knee pain. Which knee was it? Uh, the right knee. And tell me about your pain. Well, it was, it was severe pain. Um, I, I play golf. Um, I used to go to the gym quite a lot, but I suddenly found that I was very restricted um, in, in movement, and it was affecting the golf quite badly. And I was in a lot of pain. And, and I came along, and we uh, did a scan, uh, an MRI, and um, I think we discovered that I had arthritis behind the kneecap and a torn meniscus. Torn meniscus you had? Yes. And medial arthritis? Medial arthritis. And, um, and some arthritis behind your knee. Correct. And before that, you were going to the gym regularly? Yes, yeah. But how long had the pain been progressing? Um, probably about nine months. And how much, what, what treatments had you tried? Um, uh, physiotherapy. Okay, and what, what was that like? Um, that was okay, but um, I was doing a, a, 
a bespoke program. Um, but I got to the point where, where, where it became so um, stiff and sore that the exercises that I was doing for the, um, for the rehab, if you like, mm. um, I was unable to do them. And, and I lost more and more leg strength, okay. uh, particularly in the quads. And were you taking painkillers? No, not at that stage. And were you doing any exercise in the gym or at home? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I still did, um, uh, you know, I, three or four um, spinning classes a week because oh. I found I could tolerate those, it, providing I didn't uh, obey all instructions in terms of standing up on the bike. But if I was, I, I was, so I was getting my cardiovascular work out, okay. From okay. That. And that was during, during lockdown and that was helpful. Uh, you know, during lockdown, I, a, a peculiar thing happened. I was doing the Joe Wicks um, every, every morning because we were, we were literally were locked down because my wife's yeah. um, got lymphoma. So we yeah. were on the high risk category. And then we've got a small um, communal garden where we live. And it's got a circular, to call it a track would be a bit of an exaggeration, but there's a circular area. And I, I actually started jogging around there. Brilliant. And I was finding that actually my knee wasn't as sore jogging as it actually was walking 18 holes of golf. Okay. And when you came to see me, how bad were you? Very bad. Pain out of 10. 10 is the worst uh, pain in the world. Oh, eight. Waking you up? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Could you walk around a supermarket without pain? No, no. Could you run? Could I run? Yeah. Um, not without pain. And were you limping? Oh, you're yeah, badly, I still am. So at that time, when I saw you, and I would have offered you a knee replacement, what would you have said at that time, first one? Um, I wouldn't have been keen. I'd like to have tried something else first. Um, but were you expecting that? Were you expecting that as a possible outcome of that oh, consultation? Oh, absolutely. You were, uh, so you're kind of half hard oh, yeah, 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 I kind of went, well, let's at least go and find out. Um, and I was reassured, if you like, when then basically you said, yep, yeah, it's a new knee for you. Um, and I said, when? And you said, well, when you can't walk nine holes a lot, mm. can you do 18? And I said, yes. And you said, can you do 36? And I said, yes. And then we talked about all the other things you can do. So what, 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 was, what did we discuss? Oh, we, you? you discussed the possibility of, 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 of um, having an injection. Yes. Did we do that? I can't remember. Uh, I'm about to tell you. You tell me. <laughs> we, we, um, you then also said, well, that's going to cost you 210 quid. <laughs> you, Let's talk about money. <laughs> yeah, you, can buy, you can buy some ibuprofen for 50p. Perfect. Um, so off I went, and I, I'm not a great one for popping pills, and I did it about two hours before I played golf, and I found that that helped. But the big thing was the brace. Okay. You know, you recommended that I contact Osser and get a brace, and I did that within days. And and the service was brilliant, and I got the brace literally, you know, five days after I first, uh, you know, started the process. And then and then Serena was in um, Melbourne in Australia, yeah. and uh, I didn't realise the poor girl. It was midnight when she was fitting <laughs> fitting the brace for me, and. Um, and she did it, you know, virtually, if you like. And I started using it, playing golf, and I then reported to her within three weeks of using it, my golf had improved, you know, dramatically because I was able to make a, a movement that I hadn't realized that I'd stopped making because I'd stopped making it because of lack of confidence, I guess. A new tagline for Osser there, helps your golf game, doesn't it? And, uh, <laughs> Maybe I should go with it. I'm going to go with it as well. Yeah, 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 and, um, but it definitely, I mean, it really did. It, whether it's a kind of a placebo effect, I don't know, but wearing it just gave me the confidence and I felt very solid in, in being able to make a full turn. And I realised that I haven't been doing that. And I've subsequently discharged you now and we've, we've moved on, haven't we? No, 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 no. I then came back to you and said, the time's right for the injection. Okay. And you said, we'll give it a go. And last week you gave me the injection and the results were dramatic. In what way? It, it, very positively. I didn't realize how much pain I was in until I was no longer in pain. Okay. Um, when, I, when I play golf now, yeah, it hurts. And, but I'm still wearing the brace. Um, 
and I'm more kind of conscious that it probably hurts more when I've got the brace on and I'm walking. Mm. And it's nothing to do with the brace, by the way. It, it is to do with the fact that, you know, I, I am putting the knee under some stress by playing golf. And when you put the brace on the first time, did you instantly feel better? Yes. Straight away? Straight away. In fact, I disobeyed the instructions. Serena said you can only wear it for a very limited period of time because otherwise you run the risk of, of um, having some, uh, re, you know, some skin reaction and with it. Um, and I didn't really experience that. And I felt so comfortable in it. And I play a lot of golf that I decided that, well, I'll just keep it on. And I did. And it was okay. Two things I want to pick up before I get Andrew in to have a look at you. One was I talked about your movement. What bit of your movement was I worried about? Do you remember? Like, do you remember we talked about you not being able to straighten your knee? Oh, maybe it's the straightening the knee, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did either the brace or the injection help you do that, or what oh, have you oh, been... Oh, the, the, both have helped, but the, the injection gave me, because I wasn't in pain, mm. um, when, when you told me to go home and get my wife to press down whilst the anaesthetic was still in with the injection, mm. and that kind of worked, and I can feel that there's much more movement than there was 10 days ago. So it's important, I'm sure Andrew and I will, he'll ask me about the role of injections here to help you do your exercises. And the second final point before I get Andrew in is, so now, if you talked about knee replacement to you, what would you be saying to me? Um, not if we can help it. And do you think you're in a much better place now? Oh, definitely. I'm, I'm in a much better place. And I think that if I can gain the confidence and, uh, uh, to go back to exercising properly, that's, uh, that's the issue. I mean... I've done enough exercise and sport in my life to know that over the last six months, I haven't been a good boy in that regard, you know, because I think I've slipped into using the sore knee as an excuse not to do the exercise. Oh, and plus the fact the gyms are closed, yeah, I'm yeah. not safe, I don't want to go. So I've really become a bit of a slob. <laughs> uh, and, that, and that's the fact, I mean, you know, um, and only when, you know, when I was watching you and there with Fleur, I was thinking, oh my God, I hope he doesn't ask me to start. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll come in. Well, you can have a look. Um, Paddy, if I, can I ask you to have a little um, sit further back on the, the bed? And, um, sure. Uh, we'll talk about the brace. Um, can I just have a feel of your knees? Yeah, Chris, I'm just going to pop these up. So we were worried about the extension. Now, that's something I think physio has a huge part in. And something I think sometimes we, we maybe give in too much and say, oh, you know, actually, it's a fixed flexion. We're not going to get it straight. Now, um, did you have some physio exercise to get that straight? I think you said you were sort of pushing it down. Yeah, that was the why. I mean, uh, the physios concentrated more on getting me to build the quads up. Fine. Yeah, good. Yeah. So that, that is part of it. Um, can I just see you bend your knee? Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. And then just go as far as it will let you go. Good. And then put it down straight. And then I just want to feel the extension. So just nice and relaxed. Yeah. A little bit of extra extension here. And this one still got a little bit of an extension. Is that painful? It's sore. Sore. Okay. Rather than, I mean, wouldn't describe it as pain. Okay. And then have a little rest and just rest that foot. And I also want to just rest that quad for me. I just yeah. have a little feel of the kneecap. Is there any pain when I kind of get this kneecap moving? No, no, no. There's only one man just managed to just touch it once. Fine. And that's Paul. Yeah, he's, he's, Paul. He, he's mean sometimes, I'm afraid. Okay. <laughs> it's his yeah, 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 he knew exactly uh, where to touch it. Squeeze that for me as hard as you can. And then can I be a pain and just see that one? Okay, so considering we've had a little bit of loss of flex, uh, extension, we've got fair quads. Now, have a rest. What I would be looking for with you, I would say, is hope the injection seems to have helped with pain. I think there's a little bit more extension in there to get. And the key for you is that, I wouldn't want you to stop trying to get that extension because I don't want the knee to return into that kind of little bit of flexion that you had before. So I think it's important what you said, you've worked your fine muscle. And that's the bit that sometimes I find can be forgotten. People work there, you know, stretch, 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 stretch. But if I get a bit more range and I don't work this fine muscle, then, well, I'm just going to go back to where I was. Mm. So the key things for me are we have to use extra pressure to get extension we have to give you the ability to have less pain to allow you and i to work hard or get an extension and it sounds like the ibuprofen works quite well and the injections work well yeah the injection and the brace has worked well so if he's in generally less pain i'd expect him to be able to do a bit more exercise and then we need to say potentially you know, if you were coming here, I might say, do you know what? Let's get into the posterior chain. Let's loosen that hamstring, 
calf glute if you want to call it loose and let's make it feel more comfortable let's allow me to get some more extension so potentially we'd use soft tissue or if he's at home i say purchase a foam roller mm -hmm. use a foam roller to loosen off the back of the leg the calf the hamstring doesn't have to be a set amount but it's going to make you feel better into extension and then absolutely you need quad work okay. i think it'd be good to see the brace okay so before we see that what what the your colleagues what how are you managing fixed flexion now Last week he had 10 degrees, so I'm really pleased. Something happened over since the injection, which really mm. helped, and that's my role. So yep. injections help the rehab. That's what I use the injections for. Yeah. Um, to do the exercises, because we know stiff knees are painful knees. Okay, so what would you do? What, what are your tips and tricks to help managing fixed flexion? Yeah, fine. So um, I would, uh, i tell you what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab something. I'm gonna come back, just bear with me. I'm just gonna grab a band, just, just two seconds. <laughs> Yeah, so I like people, and I've just grabbed a weight, but I like people to get a band. Uh, this is a power band. I might get one a little bit thicker. Um, I would normally prop the heel up, so we've got a little bit of extension, and my hand's a little bit thicker. I might just get to use a book, so we've got a comfortable range. I'd say, pop this around the back of the foot, grab hold of that for me, feel a calf stretch, and in that position, just let the leg go heavy, and I'd, I'd ask him to use a weight at the same time. Could be spread across both legs. Could be something like a kettlebell. I'm not gonna put all the resistance on, but you might have a little light weight that sits under here if you can support it. And I would work flexibility and passive long duration stretching. Now, I would let him resist, uh, relax, sorry, and I would want the weight still on here, giving you long duration stretching. Right. And I'd just get him to go on off with this. This would be how I'd use my passive extension stretching. Or if, that, if you haven't got the equipment, you flip them over on their front, shuffle them down and you do like the, the traditional sort of leg hangs where you're just letting your knee drop down into extension whilst you're laying on yeah, your front. And do you push them? So I ask them to go with what's tolerable. So um, I'll take that band for you. Yeah, sure, um, I ask, I, I, I've got the, the band look like that. Yeah. yeah. Nice. And um, how much weight? So uh, anything between five and 10 kg, I think is, is important. I normally say to them, if you can tolerate a 10, and start, start a bit below, but build up towards 10 kg. And the reason for that is because gravity is helpful, but whilst pain is low, that extra pressure, if you can tolerate even two minutes, five minutes progressively towards 10 minutes, is just gonna creep that knee down. Like me leaning on here, like the wife, Leaning on here, it takes that burden away from another person and also just creeps that knee down into extension. Oven gloves, you ever use that? Yep, oven gloves, gloves, yeah, that works really nicely. So yeah, you can pop the other, if you, as long as they're obviously joined in the middle, tin of beans or a little weight in either side, that can work nicely. Bottle of wine, each one. Bottle of wine, obviously. The problem is they get lighter as we go, obviously. Um, but <laughs> well, you won't in my case, you're Fine, right. fine. Um, but you need that heel up a little. Yeah. You've got to allow the room for that extension to come right. down. So, so a couple of books or something. Yeah, a couple of little books under yeah, there would yeah. work great for you. Um, okay. And what you want to do is let it be passive, but then relax and then work the quads into that position. And you can just come on and off. If it gets a bit sore, that's fine. Just bend the knee for a bit, yeah. have a rest. Either come back to it later the next day. If it's going well, come back to it five, 10 minutes later. Right, so before we move on to the lower, can you manage fixed flexion remotely? Uh, I think it's very difficult remotely because um, for this sort of problem, I would probably want to, well, I would want to get my hands on, I'd want to get into the really, car. Really? I'd want to get into it. I'd want to maybe anything above, especially if he's, you know, I don't think you have got any hip changes or away changes or whatnot, but if the hip's a bit stiff, that's going to affect us yeah, as well. Yeah, because yeah, you said, you said about, about the, um, about the hamstring. About, yeah, exactly. I, I mean, even though I have been very fit, I've always had, uh, the the posterior chain as all the glutes and, and, and it's always been weak because because yeah. I've all my work has been on the yeah. front and, and and running and walking and that fine yeah this is you know even when I put my my lie on my front put my knees together and flop my legs out you know I mean it was like at one it's time so, well, well hardly open fine so so I've done quite a bit of work on that to try and 
improve it, but it's not that great. And Andy, a question was just, just come in. How would you modify that protocol or the weights, for example, if it was a let's say a knee replacement that you were you were working with? Yeah, so if you the front the frontal scar um, that comes with a knee replacement might mean you need to modify. You don't necessarily need to use the weight if you can get him sitting in a chair, have the leg pads on another chair, and then you might use, as Paul said, you might use the, um, the oven glove maneuver where you can put the pressure slightly higher away from the wound, and you probably go a bit lighter to start with. Um, it doesn't, it's not necessarily just about the weight. I just feel like if people tend to go a bit light, um, and if you start too light, um, then you're not quite getting all the benefit from the time that you're putting in. So certainly whilst it's painful and sore at the start, ease your way in a bit like you would with the unloader. But as it tolerates more, I think you can creep your way further up. Yeah. So if you pass me that jar, the unloader, thanks. Uh, if you can put that on for me. Yeah, sure. So let's talk a bit about this. Grace. Yeah, so we both really like the unloader. You're, um, you're an authorised fitter. Yeah. yeah, I fit the unloader. Um, I, I like the unloader for multiple reasons, but the biggest thing for me is... Yeah that it's easy to apply, yeah. it's easy for the patient to dose, yeah. um, and you know, things like wash care, how light it is, it's a, it's a great brace for this. And you know, I would, for this sort of unloading of the medial or lateral compartment, I think the, the Oslo unloader is, is the gold standard really for this. And you know, we've done a paper on this recently. Uh, no, tell me about the paper, Paul. Yeah, you do, we discussed it on Instagram. <laughs> so it's just been submitted, Oliver Welsh from the Mind Registrars, published on 540 patients. Yep. Grade three or grade four arthritis, 80% did not go on to have a knee replacement yeah. at two years. And so, that's amazing, right? And that's why we use it. So what I want to discuss now, so if you just walk with me. Just uh, come this way, Paddy. This way, sorry. sorry, sorry. I, I was receiving two instructions. Yeah, don't, I, don't worry, don't worry. Walk oh, towards Ash. Like being at home, Paddy. <laughs> okay, so Paddy, go and see Giles. Now, what I want to discuss here so we often see um is that camera on that one? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we often sit on the corner here facing this way. We often have patients come into clinic, either in the in my app patients or in your clinic, and go, can you check this brace? Yep. So I was hoping that the judge is going to give us a two minutes mm -hmm. on checking an unloader. Checking it's fitted right, checking the tension's right. That's like, is it too tight? Is it not too tight? Do you want to go through that from the charts? Yeah, not a problem. So, first of all, key landmarks that you need to be aware of. Uh, primarily, uh, the hinge marker here. So, I will explain this to you again at the end. But effectively, this allows you to, to set up the brace in the correct position. So, leg in the correct brace and vertical, first of all. So, we're in a, in a sort of 10 to 15 degrees of flexion. We're palpating the patella. And we're lining up this marker level with the top of the patella. So here like that, okay? And what's really important is that we've got the hinge in level with the axis of the knee. So as we flex and extend, it's going to stay in position. So fastening blue on blue, clipping that into position like that. And I'm just checking the calf tension as I do that. Then going up to the thigh, yellow on yellow, and again, clipping this into position. Now I'm going to make a small adjustment to the, to the thigh section. I hasten to add, this is the first time I've seen this brace. So I'm going to make a small adjustment. It's actually very common that people over tighten the top section. So from a tension perspective, always the bottom, the calf horizontal strap that we want tight. And can you just straighten the leg for me, please? Okay, I'm just going to check this first of all. That's a difficult thing to describe the level of tension. It's always a hard one to, to, to kind of communicate with people. And I know in this case, because of the COVID situation, this was fitting virtually. So yes, it was. Uh, Serena talked you yeah. through that. So go straight again for me. Uh, where you can see, I can just about get my finger underneath the strap. And actually, in this case, the lower DFS strap is a little tighter. So just bend a little bit for me. And I'm just going to go up just a touch on that top one. Um, and you can see, if you go fully straight again for me, that that is about correct. Now, there are other factors to take in mind, skin condition, for example, muscle bulk. But in your case, really good skin condition, good muscle bulk, so we can really have a good level of tension in those straps. So, really good level of fit, at hinges level uh, with the top of the patella. The front of the hinge, um, it's difficult to show from, from the side, but the front of the hinge is sat on the midline here. 
um, and it just means we've got it in a good position. So those really are the sections that you need to check. The primary thing is making sure we've got the hinge position correctly. Common things, fitting it a little bit low. And, and I was, wasn't I? A little bit. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I no, I can feel it. No, 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 no. I can feel. <laughs> I can feel it now. That it feels much more secure now. And a, a, a very good tip, actually, for, for clinicians is actually to get the patients putting on. So you can watch them uh, and their procedure of putting it on. Notice any sort of you know, natural, normal um, sort of uh, sort of differences, uh, and then you can correct those at the same time. So check the hinge position. Check the tension of those straps, and those are really the key areas that we need to check. And do you find that it's it's probably wise for patients to go back after a, a few period of time to their fitter to check it? So ideally, yes, um, it is important that, that you do get it checked. Obviously, an unusual situation because yours was fitted remotely. So sure. um, we would always, you know, always recommend that they would review these patients um, just. Uh, not only to check on the brace, but also to check on the patient because there's lots of questions, there's lots of uh, sort of changes over time. So Serena did call three weeks after okay. the fitting, uh, uh, from again from Australia, yes, and, and was you know amazing in, in in her concern, and she she looked at what I was doing. And she said, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about how it feels for you. And, mm -hmm. and, but it was, it was good. Yes, so yeah. that's yeah. really good. Yeah, so, so the after service part was great. Brilliant. It's just, it, it is about checking that just to make sure that, that you know, that they're getting on well with the brace and, and to remedy any of those, uh, sure. any of those sort of little niggles and little, little questions. Yeah. But, but, but I, think, I, I think I've slipped into being sloppy about putting it on because I put it on and off so often. Yeah. That I, that I change in the car park in the golf club at the moment because of COVID. So it, it must fit in with your yeah. life, and we can we can fix those fix those yeah. things after the session. So that's that's Correct. perfect. Brilliant, Paddy. Do you have anything else for Paddy? No, I think Paddy's doing really well. Much. Really well done. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Paddy. Thank you. Thanks for that. We'll, we'll let you slide it off if that's okay. With yeah. You. yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you, Charles. Um, so uh, it's just a, a couple of questions uh, from people. Do, do we find that the brace fits for people uh, with a large leg or perhaps a high degree of varus or valgus angulation? Now, in reality, the sander brace is designed uh, to fit 10 to 15 degrees of varus or valgus angulation. There is also a really wide range of sizes, so um, and a custom version as well. So if you have a patient with a very large leg, potentially you can use a custom version. So that is definitely an option uh, for you. Um, and are there any contraindications for using the brace? Uh, skin quality, for example, pre used grass sites uh, and that sort of thing. It is important that you look at the skin condition, uh, making sure that the, there's no sort of open wounds, for example. Uh, patients that are perhaps a lot older may have uh, slightly thinner skin or long term steroid therapy. Um, so it's important to be aware of that, but there are lots of different measures and things that you can do, uh, whether that is uh, to do with. Alternative liners, so we do have different liners depending on the, the, the setup of the, of the brace. So um, it is important to check that, but normally in most people that's, that's not too much of an issue. So we would always recommend, in terms of the skin, that you adhere to a standard procedure of wearing the braces slowly. So gradually increasing the time you wear it uh, is really important uh, in these instances. Okay, so we've, we've gone on uh, a little bit, so we're a little bit over time. So really must thank uh, the guys here so pass over to, to Andy and to Mr Stricker there uh, just to say thank you um, really appreciate your, your, your uh, insights this evening um, and really uh, thank you very much for your, for your input yep. thanks for having us well. thanks, thanks for having us, us. Thanks also. <laughs> and also as well as all the patients they really appreciate them coming in uh, here to pure sports medicine um, last remains uh, for us to, to talk about the next uh, session so we're joined with the Surrey knee meeting team uh, we actually have uh, this session on Sunday, uh, the 1st of November. Um, so please do join that. We've we'll just uh, put a link uh, in the, in the uh, chat for that. So please do sign up for that. Um, it's got a real um, stellar uh, sort of faculty of, of speakers. There's a lot of speakers going on on that day. Um, so it's 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, so we hope you can join us for that one. Uh, again, a little ambitious from a different, uh, from a different location. So I hope you've uh, enjoyed tonight. A little bit of a different session than perhaps we've done before. Um, a few sound issues and a few entertaining bits along the way, but I hope we've uh, we'll cope with those. 
Uh, you did notice that I'm still on a box as well, which uh, <laughs> it's not because I'm short the TV is nine foot in the air. So uh, yes, um, but thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate you joining us for this long session tonight, and uh, we'll leave you to it. Thank you. <laughs>